community of Houston, Texas, this is The Awakened Life with Rev. Howard Caesar. Unity is a non-denominational spiritual community, providing a positive, practical, and progressive approach to Christianity. Let's join the service in progress now with Rev. Howard Caesar. I have yet many things to say to you. <laughs> and you cannot bear them now. I have yet many things to say to you, and yet you cannot bear them now. Who said that? Besides me just now. <laughs> Who said that? Jesus said that. Did you know that Jesus said that? Yeah, you can go to the Gospel of John, the, what is it, the 16th chapter, the 12th verse, and that is what Jesus said. It is a quote. And so, having said that, Yet, I have many things to say to you, but you cannot bear them now. We know that there are many things that, you know, basically, even in Jesus' time, uh, were beyond the scope of the listener, beyond the scope of the disciples, to really grasp what the true meaning was, to comprehend. And so Jesus didn't share. Uh, they weren't ready for it yet, spiritually. Um, there's more for us, therefore, to understand always. It is a progression. It is an unfoldment. It is a path. And we continue to grow and expand in that. And really, our willingness to believe what we cannot understand or what we cannot explain or currently comprehend can vary among us because there are things that we have to, at some point, believe even when we don't fully understand. There's some mystery here involved. A lot of life is mystery, and we have to get comfortable with that. And so for some, it's easy for them to go outside the box you know, they're kind of comfortable with that. They're almost excited about it. They like something new and fresh, even something new and different uh, to explore it, comprehend, or, or not comprehend, but contemplate. And then for others, it's more difficult. You know, uh, we have different personalities and makeups, and some people are really uncomfortable to accept what they can't really fully comprehend, what they haven't themselves personally experienced. And so um, I want you to recall with me a story from the Bible that you're familiar with. It has to do with Jesus' resurrection. And... Uh, it was, it's found in uh, the 20th chapter of the Gospel of John, and it's the story where Mary Magdalene, uh, she is the first to arrive at the sepulcher uh, where Jesus had been laying, and she finds, and it's very early in the morning, it's still dark, she finds that the stone has been rolled away, and uh, she's all upset because, you know, Jesus isn't there, and she rans, ran to find some disciples, found two, one of them was Peter, and uh, they, t she told them that Jesus was gone, you know, he's not there where he had laid. And uh, so they all ran back to the sepulcher, and, uh, and the disciples saw, yeah, there was just the, the linen cloths there where he had been laid. And uh, one of the disciples said, I believe. And uh, we think that is Peter, because Peter metaphysically really represents faith. And uh, they all left, except for Mary. And Mary stayed there at the foot of the opening there and, and, and wept. She was crying and weeping. And um, it says that at some point she stooped and looked into the sepulcher, and uh, what did she see but two angels? She saw two angels in there. And they asked her, why are you weeping? And she responded by saying, they have taken away my Lord, and I don't know where they have laid him. And uh, basically, she does not understand what is really happening. You get that? She's looked in and seen two angels. It didn't seem to be two Freaked out by that. Uh, I don't know how many of you had two angels sitting in your room or <laughs> up here, you know, whatever. So that's interesting. Um, but she wants to know where the body is. And so after saying this, she turns around and she sees Jesus standing there. And uh, she doesn't know that it's him. And Jesus said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? And assuming that it was the gardener, because she didn't know who this was, uh, she asked him where Jesus had laid. And uh, at this point, he addresses her differently. First he had said, woman, why are you weeping? And now he simply said, Mary. And with that, she gasped and said, master. So she recognized. Now, do you think that she really understood what was all going on there? You know, that she had comprehended. It was a, a mystery. What are you doing here, Jesus? How did this happen? You know, uh, she's just happy to see Jesus, of course. 
But anyway, the same day, as you continue in this passage in the story, it's interesting, the same day at evening, we are told that with the doors shut where the disciples had gathered, um, Jesus came and stood in their midst. And uh, he said to them, peace be unto you. And then he showed them his hands. He showed them his side. The disciples were happy to see Jesus. And uh, do you think they understood how it was that he was there? It's interesting, the passage, the passage says, uh, with the doors shut, meaning there was no door that opened and closed. He just dropped in. All right? So you think they understood how that all was going on, how that happened? That was, had to be some kind of a mystery, don't you think? How did Jesus do that? So there are happenings. Interesting. And uh, so anyway, there was one disciple who was absent from this uh, Jesus showing up. You know who it was? It was Thomas. Remember Thomas? Thomas was sleeping or something. I don't know. He wasn't there. And the disciples, the disciples said, guess what? We have seen Jesus. Yeah, he showed up right here. And, and man, he showed us his hands, you know, and he showed us his side. And man, it was so cool. It's so great. And you know what Thomas said? Paraphrasing? Baloney. You guys are crazy. The scripture says, unless I see in his hands the print of the nails, and I thrust my hand in his, into his side, I will not believe. The passage then states, going on, after eight days, eight days later, Jesus appeared again to the disciples. And uh, this time, Thomas is present. And it says again, and the doors were shut. So we know he didn't come in through the door. Okay, he suddenly appears. And it seems like it's important to the passage and the writer and whoever, that you get that. And Jesus said to Thomas, see my hands, okay? Put your fingers into my uh, side, you know. Uh, be not faithless, be believing. And then Thomas' response was, oh, my Lord and my God. And so he accepted. But then Jesus said to him, Thomas, because you have seen me, you have believed. And blessed are they that have not seen, and yet they believe. So I share this because I, uh, I invite you to ask yourself, you know, when it comes to the realm of spiritual things, the unusual, the supernatural, the uh, what's maybe referred to as miracles, the unexplainable the mysteries, you know, are, are you inclined to be a doubting Thomas? Are you inclined to say, no chance? Go somewhere else. Listen to somebody. Let somebody else know about this. You know? Or are you one who has room for some things that uh, may be difficult to accept or believe, and you don't necessarily have all the dots together as to how that maybe happened? There is uh, much that is said about the difference between spirituality and religion. Religion and spirituality. Okay, some people say, I'm not religious, but I'm spiritual. And that's fine, and that's good, and we can explain that. We've done that before. But at Unity, we bless all religions, okay? And there are many levels and depths, however, to spirituality. And uh, as one evolves and grows and unfolds, you're going to go from the shallows into the deep uh, because you're more ready and things begin to make more sense, and that's how evolution happens. You're not going to know calculus until you can add two plus two and, and progress. And that's the way it is even spiritually. And so understand that a religion is a human creation, okay? Religion is a human creation. Spirituality is the truth of God through the light and the voice and the presence and the power of the divine communicating it. Religion is what man has been able to, at its level of unfoldment, grasp and put into doctrine, dogma, and ideas and teachings. And so it has merits and it has flaws. Religion is good, be sure to know that, but it's often afraid of what it doesn't understand. And oftentimes there is fear around what is unfamiliar, what is unexplainable, what is mystery. And, uh, and that basically there are things that are there for a person's progress and advancement that often one in religion gets closed off to. Uh, 
Uh, they're afraid. Science, you know, continues to discover, so religion must also come from that place, not be too closed or shut down. The Wright brothers, you know, they were, I'm told, told by their uh, very religious father uh, that the desire, their desire to fly was actually the work of the devil, um, and that if God wanted you to fly, he would have given you wings. So again, religion sometimes, you know, bumps up against progress uh, and, so, and uses, no, it's okay the way it is. Um, so religion has given us also various concepts that uh, we sometimes accept uh, even if half the planet believes something else and we don't even look at that, give it the time of day, contemplate it. Uh, Western Christianity accepts that there are two planes of existence after death, heaven and hell. That's Christianity and Western. No one knows what the cutoff line is. Have you ever thought about that? Um, you know, in golf, uh, the PGA, the professional golf tournament uh, professionals, you know, they have four days of golf on a weekend at a tournament. And the first two days, they ca calculate their scores. And uh, if you don't score well enough, you don't get to play uh, on the weekend, you know? And so if a person believes in two places, heaven and hell, what score in life do you have to get to continue in the game, <laughs> you know, in heaven. Uh, we never, nobody ever talks about that. Uh, where's the dividing line? It just what, what score do you have to get that's good enough to make it into heaven, you know? And, and what's the score that's just not good enough, but you're close, <laughs> that keeps you out? So, and of course, in unity, we don't teach that there is a physical hell. Uh, you go through your hell here in this life. Uh, in terms of states of mind and senses of separation. So also, you know, we teach what Jesus said, which was, in my Father's house are many mansions, and the, tra and the scholars tell us that what he said there really is translated wrong. He said, in my Father's house are many rooms, and he's talking about many realms. So he's talking about, even for those who would believe in just two, a heaven and a hell, uh, Jesus said, no, there are many. There are many rooms uh, beyond this one where you rest momently. And so Christianity used to actually uh, have among its accepted teachings reincarnation. Um, and those of you who have studied and read know that in the fourth century, um, there were basically uh, documents established at uh, the Council of Nicaea and the Council of uh, Constantinople, uh, where politically uh, they f formulated an edict in which that was now removed. But it was a part of the teachings up until the fourth century. And that there are things in the scriptures that uh, reveal that reincarnation was very much accepted in the time of Jesus. And Jesus said, who do men say that I am? And the disciples said, uh, some say Isaiah, Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. Duh, they were all dead. Um, <laughs> that he had returned as one of them. We are told in the scriptures that who they saw the John the Baptist to be, he, he was uh, Elijah uh, from the Old Testament returned into the body of John of God. I mean, uh, John the Baptist. So there was a, there's a lot of evidence that that was accepted back then. So what are we to believe, you know, really? Uh, it's not so black and white sometimes. Um, do you believe in angels? Mary had to. She had to appear in front of her, you know? Um, they're throughout the scriptures. And uh, do you believe that there are angels even if you haven't had one appear in front of you? I do, you know? Um, an angel is a being of goodness, it's a good spirit, it's a, 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 an entity that has evolved and is in a helping modality, you know, helping with guidance and various other ways. And, uh, it may appear, as it did to Mary, and, and I know some people who've had that experience, it may send a thought, uh, and it's for you to either accept it or not, and sometimes it's almost as if there was a voice that spoke to you, uh, and I've had that experience, and it was that kind of experience that actually led me into the ministry. It was almost like a, a voice. It was that strong in my head that came and told me, you know, under certain terms, get on with it, you know. But anyway, an angel is a spirit. Um, and, uh, you know, the Bible tells us even that we can communicate with those who have crossed over. There's an instance in uh, 1 Samuel, 28th chapter. You can go to it, and, and basically it's a reference to a medium. 
and uh, that that was kind of accepted. I'll, I'll tell you quickly what it is. In verse 3 of that chapter, um, it states, and this is exactly what it says, Now Samuel was dead, and all Israel had lamented him and buried him in Ramah, his homeland. So Samuel's dead. Samuel was a friend of and acquaintance of Saul. And so next we go to the fact that Saul is preparing for battle against the Philistines. And um, it's a big army. Saul sees it. And they're preparing, the, they're lining up, and they're going to do battle the next day. And he sees how big the army is and how much he's outnumbered, and he gets really worried. So what does he do? He seeks out this medium, a woman. And he goes in a disguise because he's not highly thought of with all the thing, bad things he did with his armies. So Saul's a bad guy. And he goes to this lady, and verse 11 of that passage has the woman saying, well, who shall I bring up for you? Who shall I bring forth, in other words? And he said, bring up Samuel for me. And the passage says, when she saw Samuel, when Samuel appears, uh, she cried out to Saul, why have you deceived me? You are Saul. Somehow or another, she recognized that Saul, who was um, in a disguise, she realized it was him. But, but what's important here is that then Samuel, who you know, had died previously, um, apparently materialized as a spirit in this passage, as it's spoken, and said to Saul, why have you disturbed me? <laughs> why have you disturbed me by bringing me up? That was the, that's the line. And Saul says, well, I was sorely distressed. And uh, the passage goes on from there. You don't need to near hear any more, but it's simply saying, what about that? What do you do with that? You know, there are people who say, oh, mediumship is nonsense, it's baloney. Well, yeah, there are many frauds and charlatans, but there's also some out there that are actually doing a good work. And so why am I addressing all of this? I am building a foundation to tell you a little bit about where I just have come from, which is my sixth time uh, to go to John of God in Abhijania, uh, Brazil, and his healing ministry. And he is a medium, and he's a famous medium, and he's been doing it for 50 years, and he's healed over a million people. And uh, when you do something for 50 years, and you get results, and you come from a very spiritual base, and you're saying, it's not me, and it's not the spirits that move through me, it is God that is doing it all. It's very, and, and so I went there, uh, I don't know, 10 years ago or something, and I went on my own and checked it out, and, uh, and from there I saw the powerful things that were happening in people's lives, and the difference that was being made, and it was valid. I couldn't explain it, and I was a little scared to bring, you know, tell you about it, a little scared telling you about it today, because uh, who knows what you, you know, where you are on that. But you can't deny that good things are happening and healings are taking place. And many a person has been there, um, professionals, uh, scientists, and studies have been done, and they basically can't figure out what is taking place, but they admit something amazing is going on there, even though they can't explain it. You know, healings are happening in pretty dramatic fashion. And so God works in many ways. And uh, John of God is a famous medium, okay? And uh, a medium is a, one who channels and communicates between the physical and the spiritual worlds and it establishes links. Sometimes has like a sixth sense. It's a gift that he has. He calls it his divine mission. He has no choice. This is what he was given to do in this life. He continues to do. He's in his 70s, and he's still doing this and incredible work. So good spirits come through. You can call them angels if you want. They use John of God, and they do the work. They tell us that there are actually thousands of these spirits or angels that are a part of doing the work, and they do spiritual surgeries. They don't touch you at all. They basically are doing things invisibly, and you experience the results. Some are verified with sutures that they find inside of people when they take pictures, when they go back to their hospital, That's, that there's been work done internally, and nobody's touched them. So we can't explain that, uh, but they're getting results. Um, some of the cures uh, include things like cancer, degenerative illnesses, hepatitis, leukemia, diabetes, palpitations, Parkinson's, Alzheimer's, angina, paralysis, allergy, pneumonia, uh, many existential problems, which mean, you know, things having to do with uh, 
conflicts internally, uh, moving beyond so you can be happier. It's just internal things, maybe not uh, health as it's related to the physical body, existential stuff. Oprah Winfrey went there several years ago. They have pictures of it. Uh, she uh, had an article written in her magazine, O. Oh, she also did a segment on it in her TV show. Um, again, ama witnessed amazing things, reported on amazing things. Dr. Wayne Dyer. Um, who is a famous author and has been here to speak. Um, he, it was discovered that he had leukemia. He was diagnosed for leukemia. And that somehow or another, he found out about John of God and uh, sought his help. And he received a healing from John of God uh, and the work of the Casa. Uh, it was really God, but it was the work that they were doing there. And he was so moved on a radio program telling about it, he broke down emotionally. Uh, he witnessed and experienced something. Shirley MacLaine was healed there. There's a famous opera singer that lost her voice, went there, got it back, was back singing in New York again. A colleague of mine, some of you know, has spoken here, Reverend Edwin Gaines. She was diagnosed several years back with a brain aneurysm that was inoperable. Told to get her affairs in order, she had five or six months to live. She didn't think it was over, and somehow or another, through prayer, she heard about uh, the work at the Casa in Brazil, John of God, went there, had a spiritual surgery, came back, they took pictures, uh, her doctors did, and verified it was now gone. It was gone. How's that happen? You know, is it craziness? Is that weird? Is it strange? Should we run from it? Or should we maybe run to it? I don't know. I'm not trying to convince you of anything. I'm only trying to expose you to open your mind and not be too quick to shut the door. You know and uh, to realize that there are mysteries and things that go on in this world. And hopefully, as we advance and progress as a planet, as a people, that segments of our societies will have bodies of people that will be open to, to taking us forward. Just as science progresses and discovers, so should religion discover more of what is spiritual and the truth and ways to help and ways that you can be helped. Um, so I, I went there this time, and I had a need myself. I had um, strained my hip back in April. And um, from that time, I was really walking with a limp. I could hardly get out of my car. And uh, I had pain every night to keep me awake. So I had hoped that you know, going there in, uh, in late July that uh, I could receive help. Uh, I, prior to that, I went and, uh, to an orthopedic, and I was x-rayed, and he said, clearly, uh, you uh, need to have a hip replacement. So um, I didn't go with that, and uh, tried to bear the pain until I went there. Went, and when I went before uh, John of God, who had a spirit, who they basically scan you and evaluate you very quickly, very quickly. It's a, it's a, a mystery. Uh, was told, don't need surgery. We can help you. Now, they can't help any, everyone, and they say that. They don't always achieve success. Uh, but they can tell you what they can do and how they can help you if you're willing to do what is necessary. So anyway, I, I did what, was, uh, what I was told, and, and uh, I have had uh, results. I mean, I'm, I'm not feeling any more pain. Um, I, I pray that that continues. But uh, what do I have to attribute it to except that they said they were going to help me, and they did. Uh, and they are. And I see that as the work of God. The same way that I see a physician or a nurse here in the physical, in this life, in this world, as doing the work of God. They will tell you they didn't heal anybody. They are doing what they know to do to put you in position for God to take over in the healing process. They don't understand how healing happens, okay? But consciousness plays a role. So while I was there, I just, you know, the reason I want to talk about this is I was so guided to. I wanted to go and give you another topic or talk, and all week I kept being brought back to this. I, it was a dry run every time I looked for other topics. Uh, so I finally surrendered. Uh, somehow you're meant to hear about this, whether you know about them already or not. But to acknowledge simply the existence that there is a spiritual healing uh, and spiritual cures that exist out there, whether you take access of them or not. Some people can't go, and actually they send pictures, and people get results from having sent a picture. Wayne Dyer didn't go physically, uh, and he had the healing. So there are some amazing things that we don't understand that are happening there, and so it's to let people know there is such a place. And simply because it so has moved me. When you're there, you feel such a loving energy and, and a presence that there is, there is love and healing energies going on. Uh, you feel it. It's like 
Um, it's hard to, to describe an experience like that. Um, but there was a book that was given to me, and there were many uh, things in that book. Um, it was given to me by the spirit that was in John of God when I went by him and saw him. And uh, so it was really neat to get that gift. And I read it, and it, it, in there you see how they emphasize the importance of prayer and the work that it's all God and uh, meditation being important. And they talk about that as being in the current. And they have a big room where uh, 200 people are, are simply meditating, and that becomes the energy in the current that helps also um, people faith and how important that is. Positive thinking, without a doubt, they say, is an important factor, but not the only one. Um, that a negative thought and conduct may produce illness. They talk about the deadly sins, not to get you know, caught up in them. And the deadly sins you've heard, wrath, lust, gluttony, sloth, pride, greed, envy. Okay, we've all had some of that a little bit, but you don't want to you know, get caught and stuck in it. Attending a, relig a religion, they said, I was happy to hear, is, is good. <laughs> you know, because uh, one of the reasons, as they said, is you're, you're being around a body of people with good intentions. You know, um, you're in good energies, uh, good people, altruistic people. Uh, it's always good to be in proximity uh, to good company, good energy like that. Uh, sharing feelings, they said, is very important, whether it be with clergy or a therapist, psychologist, relative, or friend. Uh, it's always a benefit uh, for both body and soul to share, uh, to release, to surrender that way. Most important is your spiritual path, your spiritual health, spiritual consciousness. In other words, it's not just your physical health, but looking at what's your spiritual health and self-knowledge, very, very important. They talk about there being no life or death, that the spirit in or out of the physical is always alive, always alive. Reincarnation, obviously, is accepted. The emphasis is we are all children of God and that God does all the healing. And so, uh, really, uh, there's so much that I, I could share and probably haven't, haven't covered, but um, I just want to say there are many paths to healing. Healing is going on all the time. And uh, wherever you may be, healing is and can take place. Uh, this is one path to healing. It's not for everyone, certainly. Uh, but it was ve it's very fulfilling to see people putting down crutches and uh, having pain go away and having results, uh, some immediate and some over periods of time. Uh, and they will tell you maybe how long it may take if they feel they can help you. Very fulfilling. And I, it also gave me a sense of how much is around us in ways that God has arranged the order of the universe to provide help and guidance and assistance at all time. We truly are never alone. We have the armies of God all around us, whether we can see them or not. And that's a very powerful thing. I believe that I have good spirits around me. Do you? Do you? Okay. There's a quote by St. Ignatius, and St. Ignatius was the one who began the, uh, the Jesuit order. He said, for those who believe, no words are necessary. But for those, for those who do not believe, no words are possible. <laughs> and so may we all be open to God's grace in all its forms. God bless you all. Thank you for joining us for today's message. We invite you to be with us again next Sunday. Unity is inclusive, welcoming people of all walks of life in dignity and love. We believe that love, strength, and goodness dwells within you. May we all live in unity with God, humanity, and all of God's creation. And remember, as Reverend Caesar says, life is meant to be good.